merely effective field theory, like the field theories that our friends in condensed matter physics have been using for years. Uh, and that is as low energy approximations to some fundamental theory, which might not even be a field theory. Uh, with one exception, the standard model is just what you would expect, given a set of symmetry, gauge symmetries and given a menu of multiplets of the symmetry group, uh, the standard model was just what you would expect on this basis. It was a field theory, uh, but as I said, that doesn't really have much to do with whether the fundamental theory would be a field theory. There is a theorem, or if you like, a folk theorem, that any theory, whatever, that's consistent with relativity and quantum mechanics will, at sufficiently low energies, look like a quantum field theory. It has to satisfy the cost of decomposition principle. So. But that's about all you need to assume. Uh, in such a theory, if the fundamental energy scale is very high, uh, physics at much lower energies, where we do our experiments, would be dominated by renormalizable interactions, those with, whose coupling constants are dimensionless. Uh, and these, and that was, that is what the standard model was. It was a renormalizable quantum field theory. Uh, and as a renormalizable quantum field theory, it's tightly constrained. In fact, so much so that the theory automatically has a set of accidental symmetries, symmetries that are not true symmetries of some fundamental theory, but just occur from the limitations that renormalizability imposes on the effective field theory. For the strong interactions, these were just the accidental symmetries that we've been lo learning about ever since World War II. Uh, various flavor conservation principles, like strangeness and so on, uh, charge conjugation variance, parity aside from a non-perturbative effect which was cured by another symmetry called the Pache-Quinn symmetry, and in the limit of small quark masses, even the whole of the chiral SU3 cross SU3 symmetry, which accounted for isotopic spin and for the properties of soft pions and so on. For the weak interactions, the accidental symmetries were baryon and lepton conservation, except that at high temperature, only baryon number minus lepton number conservation survives. In addition to these renormalizable interactions, the theory would inevitably involve non-renormalizable interactions, interactions with more derivatives or factors of fields whose coupling constants were negative powers of some mass. And if that mass that they were negative powers of was anything like the fundamental mass, these would be highly suppressed. And so they would not show up in our experiments except if they violated some of the accidental symmetries, then they would stand out. And this set in train a search for effects of these non-renormalizable accidental symmetry violating uh, interactions, uh, in particular for effects that violate baryon number conservation, such as proton decay, and lepton number conservation, such as the Majorana mass for the neutrinos. Well, we've been looking and looking for proton decay, and it still seems to evade us, although the expected rate is not much below what, what we've been able to uh, study. On the other hand, I would say the one new thing, the one qualitatively new thing that's been discovered experimentally during the 25 years that this institute has been uh, in existence is, uh, as far as this search for a truly fundamental theory is concerned, is the neutrino mass. The neutrino masses violate lepton conservation, and they're just of the right order of magnitude, just what would have been expected. Sometimes people say silly things like, there's no reason why the neutrino should be massless, or there's no reason why the mass should be so small. There is a perfectly good reason. The mass is just what you think it would be. It's about 300 GeV square divided by 10 to the 16 GeV, which is what you expect, and that comes, about, it comes out to be about 0.01 volts. Uh, this comes from a non-renormalizable interaction involving 
two scalar fields and two lepton fields. There's nothing wrong, and this was another thing we had to learn, there's nothing wrong with having non-renormalizable interactions in a theory uh, as long as we regard it as an effective field theory. Um, they, we used to be paralyzed by the feeling that it was necessary that all physics be described by a renormalizable field theory. Well, we know better now, as far as canceling the divergences by absorbing them into a renormalization of the fundamental, of the coupling constants, uh, a non-renormalizable theory is just as renormalizable as a renormalizable theory. Uh, now, I said the standard model is just what you would expect given the gauge symmetries and given the variety of quarks and leptons. But there is one exception to that. I said there would be an exception. The exception is that in addition to the renormalizable terms, which we know about, and the non-renormalizable terms, which are highly suppressed, there's a super-renormalizable term, a term whose coupling constant has the dimensions of a positive power of mass. That's the term that gives the scalar fields their mass, the Higgs boson mass. What we would naturally expect that th is that that mass should be of the order of the fundamental scale, 10 to the 15 GV to 10 to the 19 GV. And it evidently isn't, or we wouldn't be here. And this problem of knowing why it's so much smaller, a few hundred GV rather than 10 to the 19 GV, known as the hierarchy problem, has driven a great deal of the theoretical speculation of the last quarter century. There really is only one natural explanation for such a hierarchy, and that is asymptotic freedom. David nodding. Uh, the, that is, if some gauge coupling constant has some moderate value at the fundamental scale, and then as you go to lower energy, grows slowly, like the inverse square of the logarithm of the energy. Then, after many, many e-foldings of growth, it will eventually become strong, and perhaps strong enough to break symmetries like the electroweak gauge symmetry. For example, it's not at all surprising that the proton mass is so very much less than the fundamental scale. The proton mass is what it is because that's the energy at which the QCD coupling becomes strong, having a value of the order of 1 20th at the fundamental scale. It takes many, many e-foldings to get strong at a GEV. Uh, the idea that the strong and electroweak symmetries are broken directly by some asymptotically free gauge coupling, which gets strong perhaps at 300 GeV, is known as technicolor. And it gives a perfectly nice account of the masses of the gauge particles, the W and the Z, works just beautiful for them, beautifully for them, but completely fails in accounting for the masses of the quarks and leptons. There are various Baroque modifications of technicolor which attempt to deal with that, and none of them have attracted much in the way of affection. Uh, the other, and I think much more popular approach to solving the hierarchy problem has been supersymmetry. Uh, again, with the idea that supersymmetry is broken by an asymptotically free gauge coupling, which, has, which becomes strong at some energy, the scale of supersymmetry breaking, the problem is not to understand supersymmetry breaking any more than it is to understand, uh, say, chiral symmetry breaking. The problem is to understand how that symmetry breaking is communicated to the particles of the standard model. And there are, I'd like to go into a little bit of detail about this because I have a very negative conclusion and I'd like to substantiate it. There are two uh, broad approaches. Uh, called gauge-mediated supersymmetry breaking and gravity-mediated supersymmetry breaking. In gauge-mediated supersymmetry breaking, the energy scale at which it's broken is rather low. That's because the particles that we know of uh, 
have to have masses which are of the order of just a few powers of coupling constants times the symmetry breaking scale. The supersymmetry breaking scale might be about 10 TeV. That gives the gravitino mass, the supersymmetric partner of the graviton, uh, of about one volt. Uh, the gravitino, therefore, could not be the dark matter particle. Other supersymmetric particles decay into the gravitino. Those decays may be slow enough so that we could see the next to lightest supersymmetric particle at accelerators, but I believe uh, that it's too rapid. Those decays are too rapid so that super, these particles could not furnish the dark matter that astronomers tell us they need. Uh, so this kind of supersymmetry mediation, supersymmetry breaking mediation, has the virtue that it accounts naturally for the flavor conservation in the neutral currents. It naturally gives you degenerate, flavor degenerate quarks and squarks and sleptons. Uh, but the problem is that in these supersymmetry theories, there is a supernormalizable term. There still is one. It's the so-called mu term. And the coefficient of that term, you would naturally expect to be at the fundamental scale. So you've really gained nothing by the introduction of supersymmetry. The other possibility is gravity-mediated supersymmetry, in which case supersymmetry is broken at some very high energy scale, not as high, perhaps, as 10 to the 15 GV, but quite high. Uh, the, the gravitino mass is narrowly constrained. It can't be too light if you want to avoid cosmological problems, and it can't be too heavy if you want to avoid naturalness problems in the mass of the Higgs boson. Uh, it its mass would have to be around 10 TeV. Lighter, it probably would be unstable and decay into lighter supersymmetric particles, some of which might, one of which might be the particle of the dark matter. Gravity-mediated supersymmetry naturally accounts for the flavor conservation in the neutral currents. Uh, excuse me. The problem, said just the opposite. The, the problem with gravity-mediated gravity supersymmetry breaking is that unlike gauge-mediated supersymmetry breaking, it doesn't naturally account for flavor conservation in the neutral currents. There are two versions of this general class of theory. There is one version in which the supersymmetry is broken directly by the asymptotically free gauge interaction. And in that case, unfortunately, you have an additional problem, which is that the gauge nodes, the supersymmetric particle partners of the W and the Z, are too light to have escaped detection so far. The other version is that the asymptotically free, slowly growing as you go to low energy gauge coupling generates a potential for scalar fields. And those scalar fields break supersymmetry just in lowest order perturbation theory. And that avoids the problem of very light gauge nodes. But this, it doesn't avoid the problem of flavor conservation in the neutral current. And so my conclusion is that there is no really satisfactory theory of supersymmetry in which supersymmetry breaking is accounted for within the standard model. If, excuse me, I should say it more generally, within the framework of elementary particles of it. I add that last remark because of something I'm going to say later on. Uh, we hope that the Large Hadron Collider will tell us whether there is supersymmetry at all at low energies, and if there is, will tell us which kind of supersymmetry breaking we have. And of course, the most exciting thing of all would be if the Large Hadron Collider would detect the particle, the neutralino or whatever it is, that makes up the dark matter which is about 30% of the energy budget of the universe. Uh, I would say that the solution to the dark matter question can't really come from astronomy. If cold dark matter is really cold and dark, then as far as astronomy is concerned, it makes no difference what it is, whether it's an axion or a neutralino or whatever. The, the, there's no distinction. 
that any astronomer uh, can observe. And so it really, if, of course, astronomy might tell us there isn't any cold dark matter or it isn't quite cold or it isn't quite dark, but if it really is cold and dark, only elementary particle physics can tell us what it is. Now, the situation with regard to gravitation is in some ways similar to the situation with regard to the other interactions. Uh, the Einstein-Hilbert-Lagrangian, uh, which leads to the Einstein equations in their original form, is just what's expected at long distances in any theory of mass zero and spin two particles. And again, with one exception. Uh, the one exception is, a, again, a super-renormalizable coupling known as the cosmological constant. Einstein introduced the cosmological constant in 1917 uh, because he was trying to account for the fact that the universe is not expanding. Uh, well, in fact, it, number one, it is expanding. Number two, in fact, the way he introduced it didn't account for that because his model was unstable. But, uh, and Einstein came to regard the introduction of the cosmological constant as his greatest mistake because it marred the beauty, beauty of the original theory. But Einstein was under the impression that nature prefers simple equations. Maybe it does, but only at a fundamental level, not in, on the level of an effective field theory. And today, no one, or at least no one sensible, <laughs> thinks that general relativity is anything but a low energy approximation to a fundamental theory. In other words, another effective field theory. As such, the Lagrangian of general relativity should contain not only the Einstein-Hilbert Lagrangian, but all possible terms allowed by general covariance. Most of these terms have additional derivatives. They're suppressed by inverse powers of some large fundamental mass, presumably the Planck mass, and they're completely negligible in the laboratory, let alone at astronomical distances. The Exception, of course, is the cosmological constant term, which becomes more and more important at greater and greater distances. But all these terms are present, doubtless. Einstein's mistake was not in introducing the cosmological constant, but in thinking it was a mistake. The mystery is not why the cosmological constant exists, but why it's so small in Planck units, of course, and this problem, along with the very similar scalar mass problem in the standard model, have been the bones in our throat for the last 25 years. No one has found any symmetry or cancellation mechanism that makes the vacuum energy zero. And I have to add, despite what some people occasionally think, that quintessence doesn't help in any way in this respect. Uh, lately, there's been increased attention to a possible anthropic explanation of the value of the cosmological constant uh, for two reasons. One is historical. Uh, before uh, supernovas, type 1A began to be used as standard candles and revealed that the energy density due to the vacuum is comparable to the energy density in matter, but in fact somewhat larger, that had been anticipated uh, on anthropic grounds, namely that uh, the cosmological constant vacuum energy can't be much larger than the mass energy density, because otherwise galaxies wouldn't form, and there's no reason why it should be much less. Uh, the other reason why this has become more popular recently is because of developments in string theory, uh, which I'll come to in a minute. Uh, actually, actually, I don't like the phrase anthropic principle. Uh, this kind of reasoning that uh, things are the way they are because otherwise we wouldn't be here is called anthropic. And this whole style of reasoning is called the anthropic principle. But I don't like that word because it's not a scientific principle like the equivalence principle that states some fundamental truth from which we can derive all sorts of consequences. Anthropic reasoning is just a way of 
dealing with something that all experimental physicists and astronomers have to deal with, and that's observational bias. We have, suppose you have a hypothesis. Uh, the hypothesis is that our Big Bang, as we observe it, is just one piece of a much larger multiverse of many, many possible Big Bangs uh, going on, perhaps different terms in a wave function, perhaps different places in space-time. Um, and each of them have different values of the vacuum energy or the cosmological constant. And there are so many of them that these values form essentially a continuum. And they're all roughly equally likely, or the a priori probability, the a priori probability distribution is some smooth function of the vacuum energy. Oh yeah, water. Um, thank you. Um, which is, is doesn't vary very much when the vacuum energy varies from the Planck scale to minus the Planck scale. Uh, and you ask the question. Uh, does this fit what we observe? Well, at first, it might, you might think it doesn't fit it because we see a vacuum energy that's so incredibly small compared to the Planck scale. But then you remember there's an observational bias. We are here. People have had to, in order to make these experiments, people have had to evolve. There had to have been planets and stars and galaxies. And that means it's only in the cases where the uh, cosmological constant is in, is incredibly small compared to the Planck scale that anyone would ever observe it. And so taking into account the observational bias, you conclude that what you would expect on this hypothesis is that it should be comparable, somewhat larger than the mass energy because uh, the mass energy dominates uh, in the early universe with um, somewhat larger than the mass energy density, not much larger, and no reason for it to be smaller. And that seems to be verified by observation. Uh, it could have been falsified. It could have been that the cosmological vacuum energy density would turn out to be vastly less than the present matter density. In that case, you would say this hypothesis has been falsified because there's no reason why it should be that small. Uh, it hasn't been falsified. It's certainly too much to say it's been verified. And I don't see how it can be verified on anthropic, just by reasoning anthropically, it has to be verified by reference to some fundamental theory which explains the multiverse and which is verified on other grounds because it makes predictions, say, for the ratio of the mass of the muon and the electron, which work. We don't have such a fundamental theory yet. The, um, the new thing in this respect from string theory is a mechanism for producing a distribution of values of the vacuum energy or the cosmological constant. Many of you here know much more about this than I do, so I'll just mention it. As I understand it, in string theory, and at least in certain approximations, the theory looks like a higher dimensional theory with a compact manifold with a complicated topology. And because of its complicated topology, there are many possibilities for flux quanta, which are quantized in the same way as flux quanta in a superconducting ring. Superconducting ring is a pretty simple topological complication. You can think of this as like a um, congealed mass of macaroni with, with many, uh, many possible flux rings, many rings through which flux can penetrate. And if there are hundreds of uh, these different types of flux quanta, each taking hundreds of possible values, you obviously get up to a rather large number, like 100 to 100 power of values of the vacuum energy density, large enough so that even within the narrow range allowed anthropically, there still is a very large number, enough to look like a smooth uh, continuum of possible values. I think this is highly plausible, although uh, uh, I have to defer to the string theorists to say how plausible it is. Uh, so far, it hasn't seemed very clear to me how this landscape, as it's called, gets populated. And I think 
because we don't really understand how the wave function of the universe becomes decoherent. That is, undoubtedly, if quantum mechanics applies to the whole universe, then how could it not? Um, there is a wave function of the universe that includes all possibilities. And uh, somehow or other, a decoherence sets in so that what any observer will observe will be one particular kind of universe with one space-time dimensionality, one value for the, for the vacuum energy and for all the other constants of nature. There are many mechanisms for this kind of decoherence. Bubble formation in eternal inflation is a popular one right now. But there are others that have been suggested in the past. Uh, some years ago, uh, there was a good deal of attention given to the possibility that the universe has a, a, ga a three-form gauge field. That's, that's a gauge field that's a three, third rank anti-symmetric tensor, uh, which uh, would produce, because its value is essentially a free parameter, would produce a, um, a breakup of the universe into, of the wave function of the universe into terms with this constant, which acts as a cosmological constant as different values. Uh, there was also a lot of attention given to the possibility of wormholes that would generate a, this kind of decoherence in the wave function. Now those two ideas became discredited because they were thought to, by, their, by the people who suggested them, they were thought to predict a wave function of the universe or a probability distribution, rather, for the, for the vacuum energy, which was very sharply peaked, in fact, infinitely sharply peaked at zero vacuum energy, thus solving the cosmological constant problem. The existence of that infinitely sharp peak has by now pretty well been discredited, and as a result, these theories have, have lost attention. But their most important conclusion, that they provide a mechanism for decoherence, which can turn a, a quantum mechanical wave function into a multiverse in which each observer observes one big bang with one set of values of the constants, that conclusion, I think, is still correct. Uh, well, this is physics in a different style, the use of anthropic ideas. And, um, your director has gone so far as to say he hates it. Uh, well, I don't love it. Um, it is a disappointment. I mean, we, as physicists, we want to be able to predict things. We would like to be able to predict the fine structure constants and the ratios of the masses of the quarks and leptons and so on. We'd like to be able to predict the vacuum energy density. And to be told that these are merely environmental parameters, uh, like the distance of the Earth from the Sun, is, is disappointing. But, you know, we may have to get over it. After all, this has happened before in the history of science. There was a time in the Middle Ages when people thought that the distribution of the continents was governed by fundamental principles of symmetry. And there were arguments at the time of Columbus having to do with how far Asia extends away from Europe that, has, that were based on symmetry principles. Uh, similarly, as everyone knows, Kepler tried to argue about the ratio of the sizes of the orbits of the planets based on certain concepts in solid geometry. Well, they learned, maybe they didn't learn, but we all have learned that those efforts were doomed to disappointment. These things, like the size of the continents and the radii of the planetary orbit, are simply uh, accidents. They're environmental parameters. To some extent, they're anthropically selected. I mean, after all, we didn't, uh, we didn't evolve on Mercury or Pluto for obvious reasons. But we will never be able to use fundamental theory to calculate the radius of the Earth's orbit. And we may never be able to use fundamental theory to calculate the vacuum energy. And we may have to get over our disappointment. <laughs>
but we don't know. And it's certainly premature to, uh, to, to try to say definitely one way or the other. There have been efforts to extend this kind of anthropic reasoning uh, to other constants. And um, there's a question, I mean, should we think of the fine structure constant as being anthropically determined? Should we think of the mass ratios of the quarks and leptons as being anthropically determined? Uh, there are several problems with that. One is a practical one. It, the anthropic principle doesn't really tell you very much in those contexts because the reason it, it, it gives such a powerful prediction in the case of the cosmological constant is because the anthropically allowed range of values of the vacuum energy is incredibly narrow compared to the natural range. If the natural range is characterized by the Planck scale and the anthropically allowed range is 10 to the minus 120 of that, then it's extremely plausible to imagine that the a priori probability distribution in that range is very flat. Because why should it vary very much in such a tiny range compared to the next? On the other hand, the anthropically allowed range of the fine structure constant, well, we don't really know what it is, but it's hard to believe that varying it by 1% would make life impossible. And so we're, it's not likely that we're going to be able to make very precise predictions. The other thing that's wrong with extending the uh, anthropic principle to other constants is uh, that if they are also variable, then you weaken the constraints on the vacuum energy, which might sound like a good thing, but if you weaken the constraints on the vacuum energy, then the problem returns. Why is the vacuum energy density as small as it is? So in other words, the one success, if you can call it that, of this way of looking at things goes out the window if you try to extend it too far. There is an interesting uh, suggestion, which I understand Arkani Hamed is going to talk about here, that the anthropic principle, anthropic considerations really apply only to super renormalizable couplings, namely the, vacuum, the cosmological constant and the scalar mass in the standard model. And so that not only do anthropic considerations explain the, uh, the smallness of the vacuum energy, they also may explain the hierarchy problem. And I'll leave it to him to defend this, but it sounds like a very interesting idea. Well, as I've said before, uh, questions like this really need uh, not just astronomical observation, but a theory that's good at the Planck scale, uh, where general relativity surely becomes irrelevant. Uh, the best candidate for such a theory that anyone knows about is string theory. Uh, we've seen over the last 30 years a series of advances in string theory, uh, anomaly cancellation, uh, first in some unphysical theories, then in a more promising theory, the heterotic string, the recognition of the importance of D-brains, duality, M-theory, which perhaps unifies all, all of the different string theories. Every advance has given a momentary optimism to the string theorist, followed by a period of disappointment that although it, we now understand string theory better. We are, don't seem to be any closer to making contact with empirical observation, uh, with, with nature. Uh, it's often said that uh, we don't really have a guiding principle that tells us what string theory has to be uh, the, in the way that the equivalence principle tells us what general relativity has to be. Uh, and I wonder if perhaps we don't already have that guiding principle. As I understand it, the reason that the string theorists devote their, work, their whole of their waking lives to string theory is because they think that it is the only way of extending what we see in nature Namely, we have a universe that's much larger than the Planck scale, 
And at scales in between the cosmological scale and the Planck scale, you have uh, something that's described, you have phenomena described by the axioms of S-matrix theory and hence by a quantum field theory. Uh, that's a long sentence. They feel that the only kind of theory that has that property and which can be extended to arbitrarily large energies and small distances is a string theory. Well, maybe that's why string theory is what it is. In other words, string theory is what it is because it's the only way of combining gravity and the standard model in four dimensions. Now, this 20 years ago, this would have seemed, or even 10 years ago, this would have seemed absurd because everyone knew 10 years ago that string theory is really a theory in 10 dimensions, not four dimensions. Um, but one of the things that's come out of uh, M-theory has been the recognition that just as four dimensions is not any more fundamental than 10 dimensions, 10 dimensions isn't any more fundamental than four dimensions. They are just different approximations to an underlying theory. So it is no more legitimate to start with a 10-dimensional formulation than with a four-dimensional formulation. And maybe that's all that string theory is. Maybe string theory is, is just the only way of doing physics that includes gravity and quantum mechanics. And if, there is some, if that's wrong, then we all ought to try hard to find out what other way there is. But my guess is that string theory is the only way. And that may be what string theory is. Uh, but that, that doesn't necessarily tell us when string theory is going to make contact with experiment. Uh, I try to be encouraging about this, even though I gave up trying to work myself in string theory about 15 years ago. Because it's true that string theory is an elaborate mathematical formalism that so far has had nothing to say about experiment, but we've seen that before. For example, Yang-Mills theory. Yang-Mills theory for 13 years was the subject of intense effort by mathematical physicists uh, who studied its structure, tried to understand its renormalizability, learned how to derive Feynman diagrams, did all sorts of things with Yang-Mills theory, and finally, we, we began to see what it was good for. It, it's responsible, it, it underlies the standard model. So these things sometimes do work out, out of, after a long period when not much seems to be happening. On the other hand, there is the example of atomic theory, which was suggested uh, by Democritus and Leucippus and for 2,000 years found no application to the real world <laughs> until Bernoulli and then Dalton. And, uh, well, the question is, which is string theory? Is it more like the Yang-Mills theory or is it more like atomic theory? And uh, it may be the geometric mean. Uh, now, the success that we've had so far in the standard model is due to the fact that, just as in condensed matter physics, uh, physics at accessible energies is insensitive to what happens at the fundamental scale. But, of course, that's the source of our trouble. Because it's insensitive, we're not learning much about the fundamental scale. And I wanted to close by saying a little bit about cosmology, because Cosmology seems to be getting into an exactly the same problem. We've had a, what's called, in fact it's now a cliche, a golden age of cosmology. A standard model which encompasses all the latest data from the cosmic microwave background, large scale structure, the, the Hubble program of comparing luminosity distances with redshifts. And this, uh, these recent observations have agree in the values they give us for the cosmological parameters and even confirm earlier estimates, say, of the age of the universe or the baryon density based on more conventional astrophysics. All of the success of the standard cosmological model uh, arises from just a few fundamental assumptions. 
there is an assumption that the universe is isotropic and homogeneous, which leads to uh, the Robertson-Walker metric. Then with the additional sp stipulation that the spatial curvature is very small. There's a specification of ratios of various conserved quantities, entropy, baryon number, lepton number. And then getting away from the average into the fluctuations, the assumption that the fluctuations are Gaussian and that they are adiabatic, which means that before horizon reentry, before the wavelength, the physical wavelength shrinks to the size of the horizon, the density perturbations in the various uh, ingredients of the universe, baryons, photons, cold dark matter, and neutrinos, divided by their respective density plus pressure is the same for all of these. All four of these delta rho over rho plus p values are equal before horizon reentry. And finally, the fact that these fluctuations when expressed in wave number space are extremely simple before horizon reentry. After that, of course, you get all the complications of acoustic waves that which we know how to calculate. Uh, but before horizon reentry, you have the initial conditions, and those are very simple. Uh, the fluctuations have equal power in every octave of wave number. Now, a lot of people have the impression that this is a tremendous confirmation of inflation. And it well may turn out that all these things are true because of inflation. I'd, I'd like to think that's true. Uh, but it's not yet at the point where one can say that inflation, much less any specific inflationary theory, is on the verge of being confirmed. Uh, first of all, the fact that these fluctuations are adiabatic. Well, as the name implies, if the universe has ever gone through a period of local thermal equilibrium in which all of the conserved quantum numbers are zero, which is what we usually assume in theories of cosmological nucleosynthesis. We assume that nucleon number and lepton number appeared uh, through non-equilibrium non things going on later, long after the reheating that follows inflation. If the universe after inflation ever went through a period of local thermal equilibrium in which all conserved quantum numbers vanished, then the perturbations, if not adiabatic, would become adiabatic in the sense I've described. And they would remain adiabatic later on, even when the universe goes out of thermal equilibrium. So the fact that the perturbations seem observationally to be adiabatic, and that's not very well known experimentally, by the way, but to the extent that it's true, it doesn't really tell us anything about whether we have single field inflation or multi field inflation or whether we have inflation at all. Also, the fact that the spectrum is so simple, that is what you expect from slow roll inflation. Actually, it's what you expect from slow roll inflation no matter how many scalar fields there are. But it's, it's not necessarily confined to that. I gave a talk about cosmology a few weeks ago uh, to the, uh, an acoustical society meeting in Austin. And they were, I don't know why they invited me, but in fact they were just delighted to learn that now astronomers and cosmologists are fascinated by sound waves per propagating through the universe, um, up until the time of recombination at least. And although we learned about them, of course, from microwave radiation. Um, they were thrilled at that, and, and then I described the, uh, this very simple, called harrison zeldovich or N equal 1 spectrum, which accounts for what we see in the cosmic microwave background in large-scale structure. And after my talk, one of the audience raised his hand, and I, I, I can't quote exactly what he said, it was something along the lines of, uh, hey boy, don't you realize that what you're seeing is 1 over F noise? Because that's what 1 over F noise, the, the, uh, the uh, spectrum, the energy between frequency F and F plus DF goes like DF over F. And, uh, you know, we see 1 over F noise all over. We don't need inflation. <laughs> uh, 
I, I personally, I, I don't mean to run down inflation. I think uh, that um, it is the best explanation we have for the universe as we see it. But we really don't have a good handle on it. We certainly don't have a handle on its details. So in this sense, cosmology is like particle physics was in 1980. It's, or maybe now entering on a much slower period uh, in which uh, it has achieved great successes, but to make further progress, uh, we, are, we have to wait for experiments. I have a nightmare with regard to the LHC that the, it may be that the only thing that will be seen at the LHC is a single neutral scalar particle. No supersymmetry, nothing else. With increasingly accurate confirmation of the standard model and no hint of anything beyond it. I can't imagine a worse disaster. <laughs> Except that in cosmology, it may be that they will face a similar disaster. That they will find that as they examine the uh, cosmic microwave background and large scale structure power spectrum more and more accurately, they will increasingly confirm the simplest assumption, the harrison zeldovich 1 over F spectrum, uh, that they will not see gravitational waves coming from the early universe. And they will be left with a standard model which works magnificently and they will be able to measure the age of the universe uh, to five significant figures. And uh, they will not have any handle on what went on uh, before the present universe. Well, uh, let's hope that's not what's going to happen. Let's hope that uh, the LHC will discover something interesting. Uh, and we can also hope that something interesting will be found in astronomy. I must say, if we're going to waste our money on manned space flight, that becomes less likely. <laughs> but there are satellites, including one European satellite known as the Planck satellite, which fortunately um, funds will not be diverted to sending jokers up into space. Uh, <laughs> Uh, which has a good chance of detecting the effect of gravitational waves on the polarization of the microwave background and uh, may, for the first time, give us a really um, incisive uh, tool for learning about the nature of inflation. So I think theoretical physics uh, and cosmology are both now in the position we've often been in the in the past of uh, waiting for experiments to give us another golden age. Thank you.